Hey guys, what's up? I'm Noah, this is Analog Resurgence, and today we're gonna take a look at Kodak's 16 millimeter motion picture film. All right, let's do it. It's been requested, people have actually asked for it, and it's kind of the next logical step in terms of formats to talk about 16 millimeter motion picture film. So first of all, one of the interesting things about 16 millimeter is that it's kind of like the middle ground in terms of motion picture formats. Now I've covered the Super 8 format in one of my first videos, and I love the format but it does have its limitations. And it is really aimed at the amateur movie maker. And 35 millimeter motion picture film is definitely a more expensive, more complex system that's definitely better aimed for professionals and large budget projects. But right in the middle of these two formats is 16 millimeter film, which is a format that over the years since its introduction has been adopted by both professionals and amateurs alike for a wide variety of projects. 16 millimeter came into existence in the 1920s when it was introduced by none other than the Eastman Kodak Company. Now at the time when it was introduced, it existed alongside 35 millimeter film, which of course was being used in large expensive productions in Hollywood. The smaller formats of eight millimeter and super eight millimeter actually wouldn't exist for years, which meant that 16 millimeter film was the first widely available and largely popular film format for amateur movie makers. Now 16 millimeter film is 16 millimeters wide, which makes it almost about half the size of 35 millimeter film. When the format was first introduced, it looked like this, with perforations down both sides. Now a frame on the film would be exposed between these four perforations, and these frames were 10.2 millimeters by 7.5 millimeters in size. The film itself looks really similar to what would later be introduced as a regular 8 millimeter film as well, but the perforations are a little bit different, and 8 millimeter is meant to be shot through 8 millimeter cameras and then cut in half. 16 millimeter film as a format put the magic of making movies into the hands of amateurs for the first time in history, but it was still considered inferior to the larger format of 35mm at the time. 16mm film though was cost effective for amateurs and it came largely in reversal stocks, which meant that all you had to do was shoot your film through your camera send it away to get processed and you would get back a positive image. Then all you had to do was load up your film that you had shot onto your trusty 16 millimeter projector and you could watch your movies right in your living room. So Kodak introduced the very first 16 millimeter camera in 1923 when they also created the format for the first time. This line of cameras were called the Cine Kodak and there are a variety of models that existed over the years, but the very first one was actually a hand crank camera and it didn't have a spring loaded motor that a lot of later amateur cameras cameras included. It's actually very close to how Kodak designed a lot of their early cameras. It's a very boxy like design with just a lens on the front, not a ton of features or buttons or different functions when you're shooting. And it was aimed at amateurs to just load up the film and get out there and start shooting. Now for the very first Cine Kodak models, you had to turn the crank on the camera at two frames per second, which meant that you were shooting film at about 16 frames per second, which was a standard at the time. But this also meant that you needed a tripod for your camera to keep it steady. Now a lot of these really early 16 millimeter cameras either took film in 50 foot spools or 100 foot spools. Today you can still get film in 100 foot spools and they come on these light tight little metal reels that the film is wound on so you can kind of use them in the daylight instead of having to load in a dark room all the time for a 100 foot roll. So shooting 100 feet of film through your Cine Kodak at 16 frames per second meant that you got about four minutes worth of footage on your film. Later Cine Kodak models included a spring wound motor which meant that you could wind the camera up and then press the button and it would shoot without you having to constantly wind it. 16 millimeter gained even more popularity when Kodak introduced the world famous color reversal film stock in the 1930s. Kodachrome. And this allowed for anybody with a 16 millimeter camera to start shooting colorful, vibrant movies of their own. Kodak even had a library of 16 millimeter films that you could order from. It was called the Kodascope Library, and you could order movies that were educational or informational or fictional, all different genres and all different types so that you could put your 16 millimeter gear to good use even if you weren't watching your own movies. The format was used across the globe in conflicts like World War II because it was small 
small enough with convenient enough cameras that soldiers or journalists could take them onto the front lines. This also helped to pave the way for 16mm as a format to be used in documentary filmmaking by filmmakers on projects that just didn't have the budget in order to use 35mm film and all the equipment and cameras and gear that went with the much larger format. Along with documentary filmmakers, 16mm also had large applications in schools as a lot of governments would fund educational projects that were shot on 16mm to be cost effective. If you look around you can buy all sorts of wild early educational films from the 50s and the 60s about all sorts of different topics that people would have watched in schools with projectors. It's really a stark contrast from when I was in school and they would always just wheel in the big cart with a VCR attached to it and later a DVD player. But 16mm was kind of the beginning of a lot of that, of watching movies in school. So journalists, documentary filmmakers, educational departments were all putting 16mm to use in a variety of different ways. And as time went on, more and more options came into existence for shooting in the 16mm format when companies like Arri introduced higher end cameras like the Arri 16S, which is definitely a step above more of the handheld amateur wind cameras. These cameras cameras would have motors and electronic components inside of them. So once 8mm and later Super 8 in the 1960s were introduced, amateurs were a little more drawn to the format because it was even more convenient over 16mm. And it was also a lot cheaper at the time to use Super 8 over 16. See, even though you can get 16mm film on these metal spools, which are safe to load in the daylight into cameras, it does still take a little bit of skill to be able to properly load and thread up the cameras, and then you also have to do manual exposure on a lot of them as well. Now in comparison, as we know, Super 8 was introduced in these plastic cartridges with cameras that had a lot of automatic functions and were a little bit easier to just pop in and use, which made them great for amateurs who just didn't want to use 16 millimeter because it had a bunch of extra steps involved. A big difference though is that you can pretty easily get positive prints made from 16 millimeter negatives. A lot of labs are set up with special printing devices that you can get print stock for and then expose your negative onto other film and you can get a positive of whatever you shoot in your 16mm camera. Super 8 though is not really easy to get positive prints made. I've touched on this before but there's a lab in Germany that does it called Andec. But for the most part print film doesn't really exist in Super 8 like it does in 16 in the larger formats and also a lot of the gear that you would need in order to make prints doesn't exist for Super 8. Which means that if you're shooting Super 8 negative it is best to get that stuff digitally transferred. Whereas if you're shooting 16 millimeter negative you can send that to a lab and get a print made which means then you have your negative you're positive and you can load that up and project it. Now also in the 1930s, 16 millimeter prints were being made that only had one set of perforations down the side. This left room on the other side for a soundtrack, either optical or magnetic that would run through a projector. But this single perf design for 16 millimeter also inspired innovation for a bigger idea. And in the 1960s, the Swedish cinematographer Rune Eriksson created the Super 16 film format. Super 16 utilized either special cameras or regular 16 cameras that would undergo conversion in order to be able to shoot a larger frame onto your film. And this larger frame allowed for a more widescreen aspect ratio, which was a little more in line with what standard movies were shooting at the time. So double perforation 16 millimeter film would have exposed a frame between between the four perforations. But once Kodak and other companies started manufacturing single perf 16 millimeter film, they could be used in cameras that allowed you to shoot a frame that extended closer to the far edge of the film. And that frame now had a size of 12 and a half millimeters by 7.4 millimeters. So an important distinction to be made is that 16 millimeter and super 16 millimeter are the same format. They just depend on how the film is perforated. Currently Kodak primarily makes single perforation film and it can be used in old school cameras like my Bolex here that only captures a more square regular 16 millimeter frame or it can be used in super 16 cameras that are capable of capturing that widescreen frame. As long as the camera isn't so old that it has transport rollers with spikes on both sides that would damage film that only has holes on one side then your camera is fine to be used with single perforation 16 millimeter film. So let's take a look at some of those stocks that Kodak currently widely makes for your 16 millimeter cameras. Now just like Super 8 film, Kodak currently makes 16 millimeter film in both color negative and black and white reversal film stocks. But Kodak also makes a black and white negative film stock for 16 millimeter that doesn't exist for Super 8. Now for color negative, there is Vision 350D, 
Vision 3 200T, Vision 3 250D, and Vision 3 500T. All of those film stocks are the same for Super 8 and 16, except that Vision 3 250D does not exist in Super 8. Now, black and white reversal is also the same between Super 8 and 16, and it comes in Kodak's Tri-X black and white reversal film stock. And reversal is, of course, a type of film stock that once you get it and get it processed properly, it will come back to you as a positive instead of a negative. And Kodak also makes their double X film stock, which is a black and white negative film stock for 16 millimeter. Now, negative films have more dynamic range, which means you can overexpose or underexpose a little more easily with those film stocks. Whereas reversal has a much narrower range of exposure. So you have to be really spot on when you're shooting stuff that's getting processed as a reversal film. Now, last year, after a long, long wait, a lot of doubt on my part about whether or not they would actually manage to do it, Kodak successfully re-released their color reversal ectochrome film stock in both Super 8 motion picture film format and 35 millimeter still film format. Now they have promised us 16 millimeter color reversal ectochrome because currently there's no widely available color reversal film in 16 millimeter format, but they have yet to really give much more of an update on it. So we might be waiting a little bit of a while for that. Now those are the main types of Kodak film that you can get to shoot in your camera. And those are the ones that are widely available and that you can buy from a variety of different sources, including Kodak themselves. But the great thing about 16 millimeter is that there are all sorts of lesser known and more obscure film stocks out there that you can get and shoot. Expired film stocks like Fuji's 16 millimeter stocks from a number of years ago can be shot and you can get wild results with some of that stuff now. There are some lesser known high contrast black and white film stocks like Kodak's 3378, which gives beautiful, low grain, fine results. Honestly, it is some of the most beautiful looking stuff I've ever seen when I get a chance to shoot it. And it's usually the most easily available stuff if I can find a place to buy it. There are also companies like Orwo that you can get black and white film from and some more obscure companies. Kodak is not the only company that currently makes black and white 16 millimeter film. They're just the most popular one that does it. Now you can also shoot 16 millimeter print stocks. Now print stocks are designed with a very, very low ISO and they're used to create prints from negatives. So you're projecting a negative onto a film that's capturing a negative. Negative of a negative, it's a positive. But they are still capable of capturing an image, so you can get experimental with some of the print stocks as well that Kodak makes, as long as you have a lot of light to be able to shoot very low ISOs like these, because they can be 12 or 6 or even lower sometimes. So when you buy 16mm film, it usually comes in two sizes. Whereas Super 8 comes in 50 foot rolls, 16 millimeter will come in either 100 foot rolls, which I mentioned come on these metal black spools in cans like these. And these are wound in a way that only the first little bit is gonna be exposed when you load it in the light. So you can take it outside and load it and you don't have to have a change bag or a dark room to do it. Now, when you're shooting 100 feet of film at 24 frames per second in a camera like a Bolex here, then you can get about two minutes and 45 seconds out of one roll of Kodak's 16 millimeter, 100 feet film. Now, if you're shooting on a larger camera, like an Arri or an Aton, instead of an amateur camera like a Bolex, then those cameras are capable of taking larger rolls of film. These are 400 foot rolls that you can buy from Kodak in all of the stocks that I mentioned. Now, 400 foot rolls of film come in these metal cans and they're not designed to be used in the light. You have to load these kinds of rolls in dark rooms or special light tight bags for cameras. So they're a little bit harder to do because you can't see what you're doing. Now this large roll of film has already been developed, so I can easily take it out and show you. But if you buy new film, don't take it out in the light. Please don't take it out in the light. It, it's, it's expensive stuff. You kind of ruin it. Don't, don't expose it. Don't, don't accidentally do that. So it will be all taped up when you get it. And when you go to open it up in the dark, it will be inside a plastic bag. Now, when they come brand new, they come in black plastic bags that are actually pretty good at sealing in some light. So if you do accidentally expose it in the light, try and have it in your plastic bag with it all folded up. 
but inside the plastic bag will be your roll of film. And this is not quite 400 feet, but this is some stuff that has already been shot. Now, 400 feet rolls of film will come on plastic cores like these. Now, this is actually what's called a print core, and this is what labs will use, and they're slightly larger than what's called a camera core. And print cores are used on prints when you're getting them back from the lab, and they're used for projectors a little bit more. But they're very similar to a smaller core like this. This is a camera core. So when you're opening up a roll of film in the dark, it will come on a smaller core like this. And these cores will fit inside your camera magazines when you're shooting and loading it in the dark. So 400 foot rolls of film do cost more and they are meant to be loaded in complete darkness. But because it's a longer footage, that means that you get more when you're shooting. So 400 feet shot through a camera at 24 frames per second will get you about 11 and a half minutes of film. And now 60 millimeter is also a little bit easier to develop your film at home. You can get black and white negative chemicals and black and white negative film for 16 millimeter. It's larger than Super 8, which means it's easier to load. And you can get these old school Soviet tanks that would let you load a lot of film into them. Now at this point, it's only slightly more expensive in the long run to shoot on 16 millimeter over Super 8. So Super 8 has lost a little bit of its appeal because over the number of years, prices have gone up so much on that format. Whereas 16 millimeter, when you weigh out the cost versus the quality and the types of cameras that you can get, then it just kind of makes a little bit more sense at certain times to choose 16 millimeter over Super 8. It also means that it's really easy to graduate from Super 8 to 16 millimeter at this point. But Super 8 is such a great way to kind of get your head around this is how movies are made on an analog format and then once you have a bit of a grasp on that 16 millimeter is just definitely the format to kind of step up your game i love 16 millimeter and i love super 8 and i love them both differently because they both have their pros and their cons. So thank you guys so much for watching and I've wanted to talk about 16 millimeter for quite some time. And I know this one is pretty long, but I hope it's been worth your time. And in the future, I'm gonna start breaking it down a little bit more. I'll look at projectors. I'm gonna look at the different types of amateur cameras that you can get, the different types of high-end professional cameras that you can get, and just kind of what is out there when you're shooting 16 millimeter and getting into it. And subscribe if you haven't done so already and you're interested in seeing that content because I swear that and more is coming soon. I'm gonna be talking about photography formats as well a little bit more, getting back to some 35, as well as looking at medium format and large format in the future as well. And just all this stuff that I just love so much. Thank you guys so much and I'll see you soon.